All right, I am online. So I did put some questions like in the last uh, 15 minutes or so into the questions text channel. So, uh, you know, those are all kind of leading questions to today's topic. So don't worry if you don't have time to take a look at those questions because we are going to talk about those today. Um, so what we are seeing here on the screen is from last week. So I suppose you know, the first thing we'll do is to make sure that we don't have any questions or if so, you know, we'll address those questions from last week. And then we're going to move on to the topic today. And I also redid the um, notes on comparison, you know, signed and unsigned comparison today. So that's also new. You know, I'm obsoleting you know, the notes from last year or year. Uh, I cannot remember when I started to use those, but those are being you know, uh, obsoleted at this point. <clears throat> All right. Interesting. Uh, some people reacted with the frog. All right. So if you have questions, you know, go ahead and post the questions in the text channels, and then you know, once the class starts, you know, we'll go ahead and. Oh, good evening. Um, so you know, once the class starts, I would go ahead and uh, address those questions one by one, you know, from the text channel. And this is why I think you know teaching synchronous online, you know, has its benefits, you know, because by using the text channels. Uh, people can actually queue up questions. So, you know, they don't have to keep holding their hands up like in the regular class until they're addressed. So they just kind of pop the questions into the text channel. I'll just kind of read each one, you know, sequentially. <clears throat> and also for people who are kind of shy, they can always, you know, direct message me. And, uh, you know, that's that's something that you cannot do with a regular class. So there's that. And I am listening to my Spotify. Probably will keep listening to it you know, for the entire lecture. It's not something that is you know that's gonna be distracting me. It's just one of those, you know, kind of spacey, kinda ambient music. Code Lo-Fi. I see. Okay. I I think I understand what that means. Oh, I have a lot of genre. You know, it's just that certain genre is not going to... Genre is not going to work when I'm lecturing. <clears throat> uh, I think my favorite is the, the, the Pet Shop Boys. It's kind of retro, you know, 1980s you know, type of music. So the band, um, you know, started in, I think, 79 or 80 or something like that. But the funny thing is they're still ongoing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and they're still going. I mean, they're still composing. They're still performing. You know, look at all of the other bands of the same era. They're all long gone. So that's, uh, that's I think that's pretty amazing. That those two you know, guys can keep going. Yeah, the West End Girls has several remixes. You know, some of the remix is better than others. <laughs> I per my personal favorite is uh, "It's a Sin." I guess that's not surprising. Yeah, some of their new songs are really good too. Um, I like the one. Uh, okay, now I have to look it up. Okay, unfortunately, the class time class time has started, so I can't really look up you know the title of my currently favorite you know Pet Shop Boys song. Uh, it has something to do with stupidity, you know, but I cannot remember the actual title. Uh, but I think it was great. It's it's a it's a great song. All right. All right. So what we're going to do today is to continue on what we talked about last Thursday. 
Jonathan talked to me, and uh, he mentioned that you know, <laughs> he he was taken you know he he was surprised that I actually used you know new notes you know to explain these concepts. <clears throat> But I definitely do things like that, you know, occasionally. It's kind of like, you know, after you write a program and you look back at the program and go like, ew, that's, that's, that's not the best way to write the program, you know. And then you just go like, I'm going to rewrite the program from scratch. And uh, so this is like, you know, the, maybe the third time or the fourth time that I have redone this topic from scratch. Uh, simply because I I personally got a per, you know, better understanding of the material, and as a result, you know I don't like to stay with the you know, old module you know, where it was not as uh, well explained. So that's kind of <clears throat> well, that's the model of the DMV. <laughs> Never touch legacy code. Yeah, that's. That's the DMV and the Franchise Tax Board, and they're still running IBM mainframe computers. Now, the mainframe computers are actually very modern. I mean, they are using the 5 nanometer process and whatnot, uh, but the code is, you know, comes all the way back from the 60s with, you know, layers and layers and layers of uh, upgrades and changes and whatnot. <clears throat> all right. Um, so what we're going to do is I want to see if you guys have any questions before I move on. This is the uh, notes from last Thursday. So if anyone has any question about, you know, the signed representation, now would be a good time to ask because we are going to continue to talk about, you know, signed comparison today. So understanding how signed numbers are represented is crucial. Um on the table I provided. I would assume that's referring to this, right? All right, so the, the way this table works is uh, you plug in K A being zero into here. You plug in K B being negative one into here. And then we plug in V being zero over here, and then we plug in, you know, um, and is uh, 16 in this case because we are dealing with uh, we're dealing with four bits, so n is 16. So that's how you know it goes. I mean, you know, a is really just the value after you plug in v and k a, n is basically 16. So you plug in these values into this part of the equation, and you get the value of a, and then you plug in uh, k b and b. Oh, excuse me. You plug in KB being negative 1 over here, and using the same V, then you end up with a value of B over here. So that's how you read the table. It's really just, you know, this, um, these two equations expressed, you know, in a very explicit way, where KA is 0, KB is negative 1, <clears throat> and then we have V ranging from 0 all the way up to 15. And you know, just based on the value of Ka, Kb, and n, which is 16, we compute you know, the values of a and b. So that's it. All right. Next question is: I actually wonder how I, how do I know it's a what? How do I know it's supposed to be a or b? We using when we transfer 4 bit to represent number in base 10. Not exactly sure what that question is asking, because all this is really showing you is the same representation you know that can be used to represent zero can also be used to represent negative sixteen based on um, congruent modulo sixteen math. So that's the whole idea. It's basically saying, okay, if you basically go around in circles, okay, you know, being at this spot here can mean a value of zero, but can also mean a value of negative 16 and so on. Um, the lab for the last four questions. Okay. So um, uh, do we still have any questions about this part here before I move on to the lab? Because I can certainly do the lab myself here today so that you guys if you have any questions here you know, we can address those questions so but I'm not going to move on until you guys you know, have no questions about you know the module itself then we can move on to the lab and talk about it all right 
right. So Eric is typing. <clears throat> but while I'm waiting for him to finish, oh, can you like, briefly explain the connection between two's complement and congruent modulo? All right, so, yes. So congruent modulo doesn't really finish the job, okay, because it basically says, you know, at a, you know with one single four-bit representation, it can be potentially, you know, it, it, because... Um, if you just add you know n times 16 to any value um, they are they are all congruent you know in uh, modulo 16 so that's helping us to a certain extent to understand that one bit pattern can have multiple interpretations but that's not going to help us to say but uh, what is the range of a signed representation versus a, the range of a sign of an unsigned representation? So congruency doesn't help with that because it just says, oh, yeah, one uh, bit pattern can be interpreted in many, many different ways. So that's why we also needed to talk about um, negative integers, you know, uh, negation or uh, two's complement, as well as you know, limiting the range of what a four-bit number or an m-bit number can represent. I'm not sure whether that's uh, making the connection or not. So congruent modulo is uh, is a concept that opens up the possibility of looking at one single bit pattern and understand that, you know, well, different values can be represented using this bit pattern. But which end are we talking about, right? You know, are we talking about n being negative 1? Are we talking about n being 0? Or are we talking about n being 20, okay? Which doesn't make any sense. So in order to represent negative values, to have signed integer representation, we are going to cut n down to say, okay, n can only be 0, or negative one, because if we go around that wheel more than once, then we are completely lost because there's no way for us to actually track how many times we have gone around the wheel. So that's why we want to limit n to only be zero or negative one. Now, n being negative one has a problem because when n is negative one, then every single value that we can represent, they're all negative, which means you know, we can no longer you know, have both positive and negative values when we look at n being negative 1. Or it's excuse me, not n, but kb being negative 1. So now we have to say, okay, so we want a blend, right? We want to be able to represent some of the non-negative values, and we also want to represent some of the negative values. How do we strike a balance between those two? That is when uh, two things happen, okay? The first thing is, um, we will go ahead and take <clears throat> the first eight of these patterns and just say that for these eight, we are going to uh, uh, we are going to use ka being zero. And then for the other eight you know bit patterns, we're going to say, okay, for these eight, we are going to use um, KB being negative one. So this way we have the values on zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven for the first um, eight bit patterns. And then for the next eight bit patterns, we have negative eight all the way down to negative one. Now, based on that interpretation, two's complement suddenly becomes handy because at that point, okay, if you take the two's complement of the bit pattern, let's say representing three here, magically, okay, just magically, we end up with the bit pattern that will be representing negative three. So two's complement is more or less a mechanism for us to start with negative three and end up with three, or for us to start with three and end up with negative three. So is that kind of helping, you know, to answer the question of how those concepts are related? And then for Omer's question, um, all that is saying is um, three and nineteen. They can they're both basically three plus some coefficient times sixteen. That's all it's saying. Oh, okay, excellent, excellent. 
Yeah, so these are very good questions, you know, because sometimes you know, I write something and I have no, I, I do not know exactly whether it's making a connection from the perspective of other people, because in my mind, obviously, everything is already connected, okay? But how do I express it so it does connect in the minds of other people? So that's usually where the difficulty comes in for me. All right. <clears throat> So I'm gonna wait a little bit more to see if any see, to see if there are any more questions about this module. If not, then we're gonna move on to the quiz. So I'm gonna do a few your know, questions or maybe the entire quiz, just so that you guys can see how it is done. And to do that, I am going to get my notes ready for today while Chris is typing. All right, so for a signed 5-bit number, the range is going to be from negative 16 to positive 15. That is correct. Because the uh, the way we calculate the range of you know, what values can be represented using the signed interpretation is right here. The range of int, which means it is signed, is from negative 2 to the power of n minus 1 to 2 to the power of n minus 1, the whole thing minus 1, where n is the number of bits. So if you substitute n equals to 5, then you end up with what Chris has in the text channel, which is from negative 16 to positive 15. Next question is, when you say do the lab, are we am I talking about tonight's or last week's? I'm talk talking about last week's because... Um, because uh, Liu Zhao you know, said, basically asking about the last lab for last four questions. So I'm going to go ahead and address that question. All right. Are we good to go? All right. Excellent. All right. So I am going back to... Oh. All right. Well, nobody is actually live. You know, everybody, you know, you guys are all behind by, you know, seven seconds or so. So let's go back here and go to the lab from last week. <clears throat> yeah, the whole uh, question, the whole matter of, you know, are we live or not, is interesting from the perspective of quantum mechanics, because um, quantum entanglement is actually faster than the speed of light. It is actually instantaneous. And that's why Einstein is, was having a big problem with that when Bohr said, hey, according to your equations, you know, you know, two things can be happening at exactly the same time, or this is this thing is causing that thing to happen instantaneously. There's no you know uh, limit based on the speed of light. And Einstein goes like, no, this cannot be. <clears throat> that was pretty, that's pretty interesting stuff. All right, so here we have the lab from last week. I think it was this one. And yep, that's the one because it has 12 points. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a preview. So this way I can actually uh, participate in all of these questions. All right. So this one is asking, you know, in a four bit subtraction, you know, one zero one one minus zero one zero zero, what is the row of the uh, borrow bits? All right, so to do this, I am going to use a spreadsheet because it's just a table, you know, and the quickest way to get to a table is a spreadsheet. <clears throat> All right, so let me just line things up a little bit better. Oh, this one won't scroll down any more, any further because, you know, that's the end of the page. All right, so let me see if I can still do this. <clears throat> All right. And to do this, I am going to make the columns a lot narrower because otherwise it's harder for us to see how the bits are lined up. There we go. All right, so we have one, zero, one, one minus uh, 0, 1, whoops, 0, 1, 0, 0. All right, so this is the x row, this is the y row, this is the q, this is the t, and then this is the d. All 
So Q is pretty easy to figure out. It's just the exclusive or between X and Y. So it's a one here, one here, one here, and one here. So we do end up with one, 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 one in this case. T0 is assumed to be zero, you know, because we are not doing um, a, uh, we're not doing a, a chained subtraction. So T0 is zero. So over here we have a zero as well because we have one zero and one zero, one minus a zero and then one minus zero in column zero. And over here is the same thing. Over here we we got a one. And then over here we got a zero. And then finally for the row of D, oops. Oops, there we go. And then for the row of D, it is the exclusive or between the Q and the T. So we got one, 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 and then we got a zero over here. So the answer to this question, what is the row of the borrow bits? Oh, I did a lot. I did a little bit more than what I needed to. So the row of the T bits would just be zero, one, zero, zero, zero. So I just type that in, zero, one, zero, zero, zero. All right, so let's see if people have any questions here. This is the lab from last Thursday. Tuesday, was it from Tuesday? Yeah, I think it's from last Thursday because we didn't talk about um, Tuesday. Okay, then you guys may be right. Um, it's due on the 9th. Okay, so you guys are right. Okay, I got the wrong date. All right, never mind. Let's do the one from uh, my mistake. I got the wrong test here. So let's do the two's complement one. There we go. All right, that makes more sense. All right, let's do this one. Oh, no, 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 not this one. Because I don't want you guys to see each other's grade. Not that, uh, you know, any lab is that super duper important. There we go. All right. What is the two's complement of the bit pattern 0, 0, 0, 0 in base 2? Write your answer as a 4-bit binary number. Oh, this one is easy. It's basically all zeros. So, uh, so basically, you, two the, you take the ones complement of zero 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 zero. So you end up with one 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 one, and then you add one to that. Okay, so one 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 as a base two number plus one is zero 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 zero, with a carry of one. But you know we don't record the carry as a part of the sum, and that's why it, it's just you know, all zeros in this case. <clears throat> and I think the specific question was the last four questions. So we're going to skip to question number five. Given a four-bit integer 1111 in base 2, what is the signed value it represents? Specify your answer in base 10. Okay, so first of all, you know, how do we get to the answer, right? There are two ways to do it, okay? One way is to look up the table that we just looked at earlier, and then keep in mind the range of values that a four-bit signed number can represent. So if you look up the table, you will see that 1111 using KA being 0, uh, the value of A is 15. And if you use KB being negative 1, then B has a value of negative 1. But then you have to think about what about the range of a signed representation? The range of a signed representation when you have only four bits is only going from negative 8 to positive 7. And then you look at 15, 15 is out of that range. So it cannot be 15, it has to be negative one in this case. And Chris is correct. The range is from negative eight to seven. So out of the two values from of A and B, only one is within that range. And in this case, the negative one, which is the B, is within that range. All right, so let's take a look at the next one. All right, so this one is kind of the same thing. You look up the table and you will find that 1001, you know, the value of A, which means KA is a zero, is nine. When KA, or KB, excuse me, when KB is a negative one, then the value of B is negative seven. And of those two, nine is out of the range, but negative seven is not. So we use negative seven in this case. 
How would you do it without the table? Ah, okay, that's a very good question. So without the table, um, you use the sign bit to help you. So the sign bit is always the most significant bit. In other words, in this case, I know it is representing a negative value. I just don't know how negative it is. So when you know it's a negative value and you just don't know how negative it is, then you have to uh, you you have to take the arithmetic negation of this bit pattern to figure out you know, the absolute value, right? To how far is it to the negative side? But instead of using um, arithmetic negation, we can use two's complement because we know those two are really doing exactly the same thing. So you apply two's complement to this value to find out the magnitude of or the absolute value. Uh, of whatever negative value this thing is. So then you have 1001, zero, zero, one, you take 2's complement, which means you have to take 1's complement first, you flip all the bits, okay? It ends up, ends up with 0, 1, 1, 0, and then you add 1 to it, it becomes 0, 1, 1, 1, which is basically 7. But 7 is not the value of 1001 zero, zero, one in base 2. It is the value of the arithmetic negation of whatever value 1001 zero, zero, one is representing. So if the arithmetic negation is 7, that means the original value is negative 7. All right, so getting to uh, the text channel, MSB equals to 1, so it's negative. Yep, exactly. So. Uh, John is correct about that. All right, so getting to question number seven. <clears throat> uh, zero, one, one, same thing. You know, it is representing a negative value. We just don't know how negative it is. So we take two's complement to find out you know, the how negative it is. One zero one one. You, if you take one's complement first, it becomes zero one zero zero. And then you add one to it because you know that's how you compute two's complement. So it becomes one zero zero plus one, which is one zero one, which has a value of five. So if the two's complement of this bit pattern is five, that means this particular bit pattern has to be representing the arithmetic negation of five, which means it is negative five. And then the last one here, because the sign bit is a zero. That means you know this value is not negative to begin with. Then you can just apply the usual base conversion thing, and just say that we have uh, zero one one two one four, and that makes it six. So there we go. So are we good so far in terms of you know understanding how uh, signed values are represented using a bit pattern? And I'm going to submit quiz even though I have not answered three of the questions. All right, excellent. All right, that is good. Yes, I skipped a whole bunch of questions, but then starting with question five, six, seven, and eight, those are all correct. <clears throat> And this particular quiz, you know, would also make some people, hopefully none, no one in this class frustrated, because I know, you know, from the past, you know, some people like to just kind of try out different things until, until they accidentally get to the right answer. This is going to be a little bit harder to, you know, just randomly try out things to get to the right answer. And it is by design. Yes. <clears throat> All right. So it looks like we do not have any further questions here. All right. Oh, I got one DM. So let me go ahead and read that DM. All right. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so I got to address that one first. Um, give me a second here. I, need, I have some server-related stuff that I need to do first. All right, done. All right, so now we are back to the originally scheduled program. Mm -hmm. All right, so are we are we good so far? Are we you know having a sufficient understanding of how negative values are represented as bit patterns?
All right, thank you. Thank you for the confirmation. So now we're going to move on to binary comparison. So binary, binary, ah, search for binary comparison. There we go. So I just typed this, you know, this is replacing something that was here already, but it really is the same thing. Okay, so if you have already read the notes before this one, you know, the obsolete one, it's okay. Okay, you know, it's not going to be uh, a waste of your time. It's just that, you know, I found a different way to present exactly the same thing. So section two here is really just a notation kind of thing. Um, it talks about you know the value, the unsigned value of a bit pattern x, but only interpreting up to m bits is going to be something like this. And I hope this is now quite familiar, uh, you know, to this class because this is how we do base conversion. This is like straight up base conversion, except we are limiting to digit zero to digit m minus one in this case. And it's also very specific to be just base 2 because you know, it's uh, multiplying the digit of xi to 2 to the power of i. So it is very specific to just base 2. So do we have any questions about the unsigned interpretation of a bit pattern? All right. <clears throat> so if we don't have any questions about that, the only one that we have not talked about you, know, you guys were asking me about that today is uh, what about the signed value interpreted based on the bit pattern X using up to M bits and you will see this one is almost exactly the same with one minor difference okay well two differences one the first difference is this one you know, in terms of the Sigma notation I goes from 0 to M minus 1 in other words all the bits are accounted for in this case My cat is screaming at me with his uh, stuffed animal baby. Anyway, <laughs> with this one, it is a little bit different, right? Yeah, because you can see how i is going from 0, but not to m minus 1 anymore. It's only going up to m minus 2. So what about bit m minus 1? It is now extra. It is external. It's outside of the sigma notation. And instead of adding x subscript m minus 1 times 2 to the power of m minus 1, instead of adding it to the rest, I'm subtracting it from the rest. And that turns out to be the easiest way to interpret the value of a signed bit pattern is really just look at the least significant bits as usual, add them up, you know, well, okay, multiply each one with its uh, corresponding power of two, but for the most significant bit, do a subtraction instead. So let's take a quick look at how that is applied. So we have a four bit pattern here, which is one, zero, one, one. So VU, okay, I should have a, a four here to, to kind of emphasize that we are interpreting only four bits. So um, assuming that you know there's an extra comma four over here, it is one plus two plus zero plus eight, which is 11. And that would be the unsigned interpretation of the bit pattern of one, zero, one, one. The same bit pattern over here, but this time it is the signed interpretation. It would be one plus two plus zero minus eight. Why is it minus eight? Because the most significant bit is a one over here. And according to this equation, we are subtracting um, the most significant bit times two to the power of the position of the most significant bit. And as a result, the value represented by one zero one one, if we choose to interpret it as signed is negative five. So I'm going to pause here and see if you guys have any questions about this portion. And while you guys are thinking and asking questions, I am going to go back and just go ahead and fix this because I cannot stand that I got the uh, equations wrong. And obviously that is unintentional. There we go. You guys can stay with that. I can you know, go ahead and change the... Uh, All right, so we got a few questions coming. That's good. All 
Um, it's not exactly two's. It's not two's complement, right? Because you know this one here is really just saying, okay, give me a bit pattern. I'll tell you what value it is. Two's complement is doing the job of um, the. Uh, it's doing the job of arithmetic negation. So this has nothing to do with. Uh, arithmetic negation. It just says, yeah, we can actually find the value of a bit pattern without having to use two's complement to figure out what value it is. So in a way, it does relate to two's complement, but it's not exactly replacing two's complement. It just says that we don't have to apply two's complement in order to find out what, uh, what is the value being represented by a bit pattern. So that's the only difference. All right, so two's complement tells us the bit pattern of the congruent modulo. Nope, two's complement is arithmetic negation. That's all it is. It is arithmetic negation, but only using one's complement plus one as the mechanism to do it. But it has the same effect as uh, the arithmetic negation. Two's complement is arithmetic negation. And if you apply the result of two's complement versus the value that you know, that you have you know, inside the uh, as the parameter of two's complement, they are not congruent. They cannot be. All right. So are we are we good so far? And by the way, the notes is already updated. So let me refresh it. <clears throat> And voila, you can see how the extra you know, parameter is now here. All right, so any questions about how VU or the unsigned value of a bit pattern versus VS, the signed value of a bit pattern, are defined or how they are computed? I'm not seeing any questions from the text channel. All right. Are we all good? Okay, excellent. Thank you for the confirmation. So now we're going to go back to kind of beat on a dead horse because you know we kind of beat on this one last week already. Because we want to find out, you know, how do we know in after a subtraction that the middle end is less than the subtrahend? So in a binary subtraction of two m bit patterns x minus y, tm, which is um, the borrow bit at bit position m equals to 1 if and only if vu x m is less than vu y m. All right, so that's basically the only thing you need to take away from the entire section because the rest of it is just a proof, which I'm not going to test. So the bottom line is this statement right here. All right. So I'm assuming some of you are taking notes. I, I hope all of you are taking notes, but I'm thinking that at least some of you are actually taking notes. So if you are in fact taking notes, this is the most important part of the entire section three, which is how can I tell whether X is less than M in the subtraction of X minus M? All you have to do is to take a look at TM. If TM equals to one, then we have confirmation that x is less than m unsigned. If you have tm being zero, all we can tell is x is not less than y. They can be equal. X can also be greater than y in this in that case. So are we okay with that concept? You're just focusing on just this statement over here. Can I give you an example? Mm. Sure. How about this one? <laughs> yes, I am cheap indeed. Okay, so in this case, can can someone point to me which one is TM? In other words, TM is saying, okay, we have an M bit subtraction and TM equals to one and blah, blah, blah. So in this example here, okay, let me just kind of <coughs> indicate which example. 
where is my TM? Which cell is TM in this case? Well, obviously, first thing, you have to figure out what M is, right? C4. Indeed, C4 is the correct answer. So we have C4 over here. That is our TM, okay? It's T4 in this case because we have a 4-bit subtraction. So you guys are all correct. Good job. So um, so what is this telling us, Tech? You know, so if TM is a 0, what, is, what, what, what kind of conclusion are we getting to? Well, all we can conclude at this point is the unsigned value represented by x is not less than the unsigned uh, value in uh, the unsigned interpretation of the bit pattern of y. That's all we are concluding. But does that make sense? Well, let's find out, right? You know, what is the unsigned value of x? We have 1 plus 2 plus 0 plus 8. So we got, what, uh, 11 in base 10. What about y? We have 0 plus 0 plus 4 plus 0. So this is just 4. 11 is less than 4 is false. Makes perfect sense, right? So that's one example. Uh, it is B4, sorry. <laughs> yes, it is B4. Um, Omer is correct. I stand corrected. It is B4. I click on the right one, but I misread the column number as C. So it is B4. That is our TM because M is 4. This is bit 0. This is bit 1, bit 2, bit 3, and this is bit 4. So if you want to look at T4, we are looking at this particular bit here. That is correct. Thank you, Omir. So are we good after that little confusion? I'll give you a second example. Okay, so I'm going to give you a second example where um, it's the opposite. Okay, you know, the T4 is going to be a 1. All right. Does M equals to 4 because it's a 4-bit? Yeah, exactly. Because how do we know, you know, the number of bits that we're subtracting? We just look at X and Y. Because X, Y, and D, they all have to have the same width, which in this case would be 4 bits. <clears throat> yep, count from 0. <laughs> yeah, Philip is correct. Yep, we have to count from 0. And that's kind of... Okay, later on in this class, when we actually start to translate C code into assembly code, then it will be extra clear why we count from 0 when we're indexing into an array. But at this point, okay, we just have to kind of keep remembering, yes, we have to keep... We have to count from 0, not from 1. All right, so I'm going to give you another example. Okay, so I am going to be a little bit lazy here okay all right so let me see if that is still viewable from your perspective looks that way okay excellent and I'm gonna give you I'm way too lazy to have to come up with an entirely different example and that's all I'm gonna do okay so we're gonna erase all of these other bits because they're all gonna be changing a little bit <clears throat> Increasing the font size a little bit. Okay, sure. Let me do that. How about that? All right, cool. No problem. All right, so figuring out the Q column, I mean, the Q row is easy because it's just the exclusive or between the X and the Y. So we, I can go in any direction. I can start any place. So it's a 0 here, 1, 1, and 1. T0 is always a 0 because we are not chaining, you know, a bunch of subtractions. So later on, maybe at some point, I'll, t I'll teach you guys why, you know, what I mean by chaining subtractions. But at this point, you know, we just assume that T0 is a 0. So now we have 1 minus 0 doesn't have a borrow of 1. 1 minus 0 does not have a borrow of 1. So this is going to be a 0 over here. And over here, same situation, 1 minus 0 does not have a borrow of 1. 1 minus 0 does not have a borrow of 1. So we have another 0 over here. Now, this one is a little bit different because 0 minus 1 does have a borrow of 1. So now we have 
um, over here we also have 0 minus 1 so this is also going to be a 1 so right here I don't even have to finish the subtraction I know right away that x is less than y when both bit patterns are interpreted unsigned so let's check that right so we go here and x has not changed it's still 11 y on the other hand is um, 0 plus 0 plus 4 plus 8 and that would be 12 11 is less than 4 I mean excuse me 11 is less than 12 is true and that is why that's indicated okay it is indicated by t4 being a 1 so t4 is a 1 if and only if x is less than y uh, interpreted unsigned isn't q also the single digit difference of x and y yes okay so uh, <clears throat> all right so this is a this is okay i this question indicates something right it is both the exclusive or and also the single digit difference and the question is what when when did we talk about this right we talked about this in the binary subtraction module because we first start with arithmetic concepts and then we figure out and go like hey according to this table for base 2 subtraction the single digit difference is exactly the same thing as exclusive or that is why we replace the arithmetic operation by a logical operation of exclusive or now it can be done using logic gates so that's good that's a good reminder right you know going back in time and ask why are we doing exclusive or when q is supposed to be the single digit difference and that's because exclusive or gets the job done and it does not depend on arithmetic concepts it's just a logical operation um well, that's a very good question too. Uh, is this concept not applied to two signed digits? Did I say anything about you know whether these things are supposed to be signed or not? Does exclusive or say anything about signed or not? No. Does and have to anything to do with you know sign, uh, signed or not? No. How about negation? How about logical negation? Does that have anything to do with signed or not? No. In other words, the subtractor and the adder that we have talked about so far does not care whether we are signed, we're dealing with signed or unsigned values. The logical operations are going to be exactly the same. So there's nothing, okay? This entire calculation has absolutely no need to know whether things are supposed to be signed or unsigned. And this one does not care either whether things are supposed to be signed or unsigned. Now, I'm going to finish up this whole calculation because I think later on it might come in handy. So I'm going to put in all of these things. So are we good so far in terms of um, showing examples of what this means? TM equals to 1 if and only if the unsigned value of x up to m bits yeah, including m bits is less than the value of y, unsigned value of y um, interpreted up to m bits. So are we good with that concept? All right. So when our MSB equals to 1, how do we quickly determine what's the value of it bef without checking the range of signed? But okay, right now, okay, don't. We're dealing with unsigned, right? So when we're dealing with unsigned, we don't want to ask anything about signed interpretation. We are just... Okay, so the other thing, okay, so getting back to the earlier notation, VU is just this. I mean, this is how we define VU, and section 3 only depends on VU. So there's no such thing as a sign bit, because the most significant bit is treated just like any other bit, okay? You multiply it with the associated power of 2, and you just add it to everybody else. All right, next one is, wait, I think I'm talking about this concept, which is in a binary subtraction of two M-bit pattern, 
x minus y tm equals to 1 if and only if blah 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 okay so since d is 1 1 1 1 and because we know that x is less than y we will take the signed interpretation of d correct nope no 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 <laughs> nope this entire section okay section three over here is all about unsigned interpretation that includes d in other words d in this case is indeed a 15. all right so to some of you you would say but tag doesn't that it doesn't make sense right you know 11 minus 12 is 15. Uh, yes, it does make sense because we have a borrow of 16. What What is this one doing here? What is TM actually indicating? TM is asking, do we owe a 16? Because this is the column of 1, column of 2, column of 4, column of 8. This is a column of 16. So when you have a borrow on the column of 16, that means even though you have $15 in your pocket, you have a debt of $16, so your net worth is negative $1. So everything makes sense. Are we good so far? So this really kind of boils down to the, the most important concept of borrowing. What is it? What, what are we talking about when we say there's a borrow from a particular digit? It is basically saying we owe you know, one, and the amount that we owe is the next column, is whatever column the borrow bit is, is located. So in this case, the borrow bit is right here. So that means we owe 16. In this case, we do not owe 16. In this case, we end up with 15, a value of 15, but we owe 16. That's why the value is actually still negative 1. It's just represented in a very strange way. All right. Cool. <clears throat> Shall we move on to section four then? And I'm pretty sure someone is going to ask, but what about the rest of section three? There's a whole bunch of stuff in section three, and we, I only talked about the first paragraph. The rest is really just to prove why this theorem is true. Why is it the case that tm equals to 1 if and only if the unsigned value of x is less than the unsigned value of y in the subtraction of x minus y? That is the proof. Now, some of you probably would not be interested in this at all. If you have taken CISP 440, on the other hand, and you know what is proved by induction, you might want to just kind of go over this a little bit, you know, because it helps to relate, you know, the content of different classes, right? Um, and that's one of the things when I was a student, you know, yeah, I think I got some cat hair, so it's kind of itchy. So when I was a student, you know, I would take maybe two or three computer science classes, but it did not feel like two or three computer science classes because I can combine, I can relate the concepts. So even though I might be taking three classes, you know, the, but the workload is about 1.5 classes because I was able to relate, you know, how the different classes relate to each other, how the concepts you know, are actually applicable to each other. So that's what, you know, that's something that you can consider doing is to basically start to relate the content of different classes. Anyway, um, this is not CISP 440, so I'm not going to go through the proof here. For those of you who want to know exactly how I proved that T equals to M if and only if VUXM is less than VUYM, this is the proof. It's proved. It's a proof by induction. All right, so now we're getting to the most confusing section, which is section 4. Section 4 talks about what about signed less than? Okay, we just talked about unsigned less than. What about signed less than? In other words, in a subtraction of x minus y, x being a bit pattern and y being a bit pattern. But if we choose to interpret the bit patterns as signed values, how can we confirm x is less than y? That is the question. So before I go any further, okay, does everybody know what this section is about? It is about the determination of whether x is less than y after a binary subtraction of x minus y, x being a bit pattern and y being a bit pattern. So I'm just going to let you guys kind of absorb that a little bit first, 
and then we're going to move on and talk about the mechanism of how that is determined. All right, looks like there are no questions. Okay, so if there are no questions, then I'm, we're going to move on. Now, unlike unlike you know, unsigned, where the actual difference of x minus y cannot be its own value when x is actually less than y interpreted unsigned, because negative 1 cannot be represented when everything is unsigned. Okay, that's basically what this sentence is trying to say, is if you have something like this, you have 11 minus 12, the answer is supposed to be negative 1, but because we are using the unsigned interpretation, the end result D can only be interpreted as 15, which is not negative 1. So yes, I did explain why 15 makes sense, but 15 by itself is not the answer, right? Because you have to combine the 15 with the overall borrow and say, yeah, you have 15, but you owe 16, so the actual you know, net value is negative 1, then it makes sense. So in signed in interpretation, it's a little bit handier, okay? Because in signed interpretation, let's go ahead and just do exactly the same thing and find out you know, what happens over here. So in signed representation, uh, what is the signed interpretation of 1, 0, 1, 1? This is a pretty good exercise of what we just learned a little bit earlier, right? This is VS applied to the bit pattern of 1, 0, 1, 1. So how do we figure out the signed value represented by 1, 0, 1, 1? Well, let's check it out, right? So it is 1 plus 2 plus 0, and then what? Minus 8. So 1 plus 2 is 3, 3 minus 8 is negative 5. So negative 5 is the VS value. It is the signed interpretation of the bit pattern of 1, 0, 1, 1. So it is negative 5. All right. <clears throat> are, are, we, are we good here? Do we understand why it is negative 5? You know, I can just go ahead and spell it out. So it's 1 plus 2 plus 0, but then we have a minus 8 at the end because the most significant bit is representing a subtraction of the power of 2 corresponding to that position. All right, so, oh, okay, so, I, why is it not calculating? Oh, it's not calculating it because I forgot to turn it back on. <clears throat> because I was showing the other class in CISP 440 the formula that I was using in one of the um, concepts. So now I'm going to turn off show formula. And it's supposed to go back and show the value. Maybe not. Oh yeah, we can we can do one more example. But you're not going to like the way I do the one more example. Well, some people may not. <clears throat> okay, but I'm not done with this one yet. I'm not done with this one. So what is this? What about this one? It's 0 plus 0 plus 4 minus 8. So that would be negative 4. What is negative 5 minus negative 4? Negative 1. Very good. So we are supposed to get negative 1 here. Are we getting negative 1 here? In other words, if I look at the bit pattern over here, is that representing negative 1? The answer is yes. Okay, Chris is right. Because we got 1 plus 2 plus 4, which is 7, minus 8. 7 minus 8 is indeed negative 1. Oh, so this is great, right? This is so convenient. All right, so knowing that the, because we're dealing with signed interpretation, we can represent negative values. So let's take a look at this you know, math reasoning over here. X is less than Y. Time to learn or relearn, right? So X is less than Y if and only if X minus Y is less than zero. Um, 
can everybody see this? You know, this is algebra, right? This is algebra applied to inequality, because if we subtract y from both sides of the inequality, um, one side gets x minus y, and then the other side gets y minus y, and that's why we that's how we end up with a zero. Are we good here? <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to assume that we are good here because this is like <clears throat> this is like algebra 2 stuff, right? All right, so oh, my face may be covering some of that stuff. Oh yeah, I am definitely covering some of that stuff. And this is why it is always handy to have your own browser open so that way, you know, you can actually refer to your notes on your side. And better yet, okay, you know, you can print my notes, you know, quote unquote print my notes into a PDF, then you can have a tool, you know, you can highlight, you can you know, mark it up and so on and so forth. So you can actually add your own notes on top of you know what I have prepared here. Anyway, um so this works out so far. Um so it looks like in that case, okay, because you know, remember x minus y is the difference, which is d, right? So if x minus y is less than zero, that means d is less than zero. If d is less than zero, then the most significant bit, which is called the sign bit, is going to be a one. So it looks like, you know, we have a pretty easy job here. In other words, if the sign bit of the difference is a one, um, okay, I, let me rephrase it. The sign bit of the difference is a 1 if and only if x is less than y interpreted signed. Or so it seems, right? So it seems that we can actually make use of the sign bit of the difference because oh, now that we can represent negative values, then we can just subtract y on both sides. And when d is less than 0, then we know what x is less than y. And to know whether d is zero is less than zero or not, we just have to look at the sign bit of d, which is the most significant of d, which is what I'm what I'm clicking on here. That seems pretty easy, okay? What is the big fuzz about you know this is actually harder compared to unsigned comparison, right? Um, but I did promise one more example, so we're gonna move back to this one as my other example. Yes, exactly. So I'm just reusing stuff all over. <clears throat> all right. So what is the value represented by 1011? We know that one. Okay. It's just negative 5 because it's exactly the same as this one over here. What about this one here? 0, 1, 0, 0. Okay. We have 0 plus 0 plus 4 minus 0 of 8. So that's just 4. Okay. Just like before. Okay. Negative 5 minus 4 is what? It's supposed to be, come on, what is negative 5 minus 4? What it is supposed to be? It is supposed to be negative 9, okay? Supposed to be negative 9. And then you look at this bit pattern here and go like, that doesn't look like negative 9. In fact, it's negative 9 within the range of a 4-bit signed integer. It's not, right? Because you guys quoted several times in you know the previous you know, uh, text messages that the range of a 4-bit signed integer can only go from negative 8 to positive 7. And negative 9 is just out of that range, right? So as a result, we have a problem because since negative 9 really cannot be represented using only 4 bits using the signed you know, uh, interpretation, it is wrong, okay? Because what we see here is actually the representation of seven. It's like, uh, what, what, what are we gonna do now? Because we we cannot trust the sign bit of the difference to tell us which one of uh, whether x is less than y or not. Because in this case, negative five is clearly less than four, and yet the sign bit of d is telling us otherwise. So it's like, what is going on here? So as it turns out, this is what we call the overflow condition. Okay, the overflow condition is when the result of a subtraction has the difference out of the range of a signed representation. Okay, so with four bits, okay, if the result of a subtraction is less than negative eight or if it is greater than seven, then we have an overflow situation. 
and I have two examples, you know, actually in the notes. Okay, the first one is the first one is right here. Okay, we have one one zero zero minus zero one zero in base two, and in this case, the actual the 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 answer is supposed to be negative nine two, but the actual result is seven. So that's you know this is an example that you guys can try to do by yourself because it is just an extra exercise for you to try to figure out how binary subtraction happens. But this can also happen in the opposite direction. So this one I'm gonna do it for you guys. Okay, so we have x being zero one 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 in base two and y being one 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 zero in base two. So let's go ahead and do this one. <clears throat> Let me scroll up a little bit so this way we it's it's not gonna fall off of the screen. All right, so we have zero one 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 minus uh, one, oops, minus one one zero uh, one 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 zero I think one 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 zero. There we go. And this is Q, which is the exclusive or between the X and Y. So we got a one here, a zero here, a zero here, and another one over here. This is T zero, assumed to be zero. No borrow from the first, uh, from column zero. So we put a zero here. No borrow from the, from column one. So we put another zero here. No borrow from column two. So we put a zero here. And then we'd have a one over here because we do have a borrow um, because of zero minus one over here. So this is the row for D's and exclusive this is the exclusive or between the Q and the T bits. So we got a one, zero, zero, one over here. Alright. So let's check out whether this makes sense or not, right? Um, and we're going to go back to the sign, unsigned representation first. So we're going a little bit back and forth here, looking at the unsigned value of 0, 1, 1, 1, that's 7. Looking at the unsigned um, value of 1, 1, 1, 0, that's 14. And then we look at the unsigned value of 1, 0, 0, 1, that's 9. And the question is, does that make sense? 7 minus 14 is a 9? No, it's not just 9, right? Because we have an extra borrow over here. So it's 9 with a debt of 16. So the net worth is 9 minus 16, which is negative 7. 7 minus 14 is negative 7. Yeah, seems to make sense. Okay, that's all good. Now we look at the signed interpretation. So using the signed interpretation, this is 1 plus 2 plus 4 minus 0. It is still 7 because the most significant bit is 0. This one is now different because we have a 0 plus 2 plus 4 minus 8. Hmm. So 2 plus 4 is 6. 6 minus 8 is negative 2. So the correct answer here is supposed to be 9 because 7 minus negative 2 is supposed to be 9. But what do we get instead? If you look at this particular bit pattern and you say, well, we're going to use the assigned interpretation. This is 1 plus 0 plus 0 minus 8, which is negative 7. It's like, whoa, hold on a second here. It cannot possibly be negative 7 because if you subtract a negative quantity from a non-negative quantity, the result should be non-negative. And yet we end up with a negative quantity because the most significant bit is a 1. So this is the other way you can overflow a binary subtraction. All right, so binary sub in a binary subtraction, overflow happens only when you look at things from a signed perspective is when the when the difference can no longer be represented using the number of bits that we can use. All right. So let me just kind of pause here and see if you guys have any questions. Yeah, they are. Yeah, yep, there there's certainly a pattern here. There's certainly a pattern so that we can easily tell whether there's an overflow or not. <clears throat> Uh, 
All right, so I'm going to let you guys you know, ask questions because I think Max was typing something. And we're going to revisit you know, these things over here and ask the question of, um, so how do we know whether there's an overflow situation or not? And you know, how, do we, how can we tell there's an overflow using the least amount of computation? All right. Oh yeah, I forgot to take row. <laughs> Let's do it now. I'm going to reset the time for row taking because I forgot to do it. Let's do it. Thank you for the reminder. My my watch did buzz and then I was telling myself, "Okay, wait until I'm done with this topic because I'm right in the middle of something." And then I forgot. Like completely forgot. Happens to me a lot when I and I'm already in the middle of a topic, you know, doing something. All right, so the <clears throat> word for row taking is not very inventive today. It is just overflow. Yeah, I wasn't feeling very creative today. There we go. So I'm just copy and pasting over here, but don't go there. Don't refresh yet because I haven't really changed the uh, the, the due date. So I'm gonna have to reset the due date to whatever now is plus about 10 minutes. All right. So what time is it? 37. So 47. Ah, let's make it 50. Right? 6:50 p.m. 6:50 p.m. Save and publish. So now you should be able to refresh and. Uh, just type in overflow. And I meanwhile, I'm getting back here. So I'll give you guys another maybe half minute or so to kind of type in the word overflow or copy and paste. And then we're going to come back here and take a look at the pattern. Is there a pattern of when overflow happens? All right, so Eric is asking, does this mean comparison operators are ultimately evaluated using subtra subtraction? Yes. So comparison is a byproduct of subtraction, which is kind of kind of cool, right? Because we know how to do binary subtraction already. It's almost exactly the same as addition, except you negate x first before you compute the p and the uh, g terms. Yep, exactly. We are looking at a sign bit. Okay, very good. So Tam is correct. We are looking at the sign bit over here. So the key are these three bits over here. This one, this one, and also this one. Let me just kind of highlight it. So this way we can tell that these are... Oh, come on. Where's the color? Oh, there we go. Background color. So let's go ahead and Highlight these. There we go. All right. All right. So what is significant about this? This is telling us that x is negative. This is telling us y is non-negative. This is telling us that d is non-negative. That doesn't make sense, does it? Because if you subtract a non-negative quantity from a negative quantity, you should always end up with a negative quantity. And in, th in this case, we ended up with a non-negative quantity. So we have an overflow. This is how we can tell there's an overflow. In this case, there's no overflow because the sign makes sense. Okay, I don't even care about the rest of the bits. I'm just looking at the sign of the minuend, the subtrahend, and the difference. In this case, the sign does make sense. Because if you subtract a negative quantity from another negative quantity, the sign can be negative or not okay it can go in both directions so last of all this one here these are the sign bits this time we start off with a non-negative quantity and subtracting from it a negative quantity whenever you subtract a non-negative excuse me whenever you subtract a negative quantity from a non-negative quantity you should always end up with a non-negative quantity but yet we end up with a negative quantity so this is how we can detect whether we have a uh, overflow situation or not. All right, so I'm just going to pause here because right now, okay, right now, I'm hoping that many of you are thinking, wait, hold on a second here. 
this this seems to remind me of something that we did last week something about the overflow flag having a little expression right that's exactly what it is okay this is exactly what overflow is about so the overflow bit is basically is a one overflow is a one if and only if the sign of the minuend is opposite to the signs of the subtrahend and the sign of the difference so whenever this bit here is opposite to these two bits we have an overflow situation and that's exactly what the equation that you saw last week in one of the lab activities was trying to tell you okay and i think this time it was last tuesday okay so th it was last tuesday when we when the lab introduced the concept of the overflow bit so if you go to the module of today's lecture yes i know there's a lot of stuff here but at some point the overflow bit is defined so the overflow flag or overflow bit is defined as this is uppercase o it is x m minus one not y m minus one not the m minus one or not x m minus one y m minus one the m minus one yes it's a mouthful but the m minus one is really just saying i'm the most significant bit okay so we are looking at the msb of x y and d whenever x is opposite to the msb of y and d we have an overflow whenever the sine bit of x is opposite to the sine bits of the of y and d we have an overflow so there are two ways to make it overflow and you know, both are illustrated in the example of today's lecture all right so now we have overflow right and the question is what does overflow have anything to do with what we were trying to do in the first place right because in the first place we were just trying to decide after a binary subtraction how can we confirm whether x is less than y or not interpreted sign that was the original question we never really cared about overflow so overflow is important because every time we have an overflow the sign bit is opposite to what it is supposed to be. So that means if overflow is a one, then you can just go ahead and negate the sign bit to get to the correct sign bit. When overflow is a zero, you can trust the sign bit as is. All right, so that means if you look at the exclusive or between the sign flag, which is the most significant bit of the difference, and the overflow flag, the exclusive or between these two is now a reliable bit that you can count on. And that bit is going to be a one if and only if the signed value of the minuend is less than the signed value of the subtrahend. Yes, that was also a mouthful, but that was the conclusion. The conclusion is if I just name this flag L for less than and define it to be the sign flag which is the sign bit of the difference exclusive or with the overflow which is defined up here then I can make this conclusion which is L equals to 1 if and only if the signed value of X is less than the signed value of Y so I'm just gonna pause here a little bit and see if you guys have any questions and if you think that I just bypassed a whole bunch of stuff up here, I did not because all of that are just examples that I have already captured in these examples down here. So this might take a little bit of time to absorb, okay? Yeah, you know, because the uh, the relationship between the overflow and the sign and what it's supposed to be that is the trick okay because every time you have an overflow the sign flag is opposite to what it is supposed to be so once you know this then you can say hey if i just take the exclusive or between the overflow and the computed sign flag then i get what the sign flag really is supposed to be then you can use that okay which i call the l flag over here to decide whether x is less than y interpreted signed or not um 
I don't have to explain it because it's in the notes right here. It is by definition d of m minus 1. I love it when I can anticipate what questions I was going to get in class. <laughs> <clears throat> But but to be to be fair, okay, you know, I, I have to say this. To be fair, this was not available to you guys, so I cannot say that. How come you guys did not read the notes ahead of time? Well, because it was not it did not exist ahead of time. So yes, I get that. But this is also important, okay? You know, once again, this is a definition, right? So what do you do when you see a definition? When you say if we define, okay, what do you do with your definitions? So that's going to be a, a question. And we have three minutes left. OK, so with three minutes left, I am going to give you some brain teasers. OK, so I'm going to put it into the text channel. It's only a brain teaser kind of the first time. You know, after you have done this like a few times, you go like, oh, yeah, we know how to do this. All right, but I will give it to you because you know I think this is something that you can do in order to really start to think about you know um, these operations. Um, let me let me just get to it first, and then I'll talk a, a little bit about it. Um, this is exam one. There we go. All right, and this is practice exam. One. All right. So in the text channel, I just uploaded a um, HTML document, and I'm going to open it just to show you what it looks like. There we go. This is what we're going to talk about on Thursday because you know before um, an actual exam because we have exam one scheduled on next Thursday. So this Thursday, we're going to have a practice exam for exam one. Um, you can read the rest you know, at this point. So the format of, of the question is kind of like this. Okay, yeah, Let me kind of zoom in because I think the font is a little bit small. So all the question marks are representing something that is unknown. And then we spell out the ones that are known. This is the L flag you know, is in lowercase. And this is the O flag in lowercase. So now we have a bunch of flags, a bunch of bits that are unknown. We know about y0, but we don't know anything about y x0. We know something about y1, but we don't know anything about x1. We only know <laughs> we only know about t2 in this case. We don't know anything about the overflow. We know the L flag is a 1. So what you're supposed to do is to figure out all of the question marks. Look at the, look at this as Sudoku. Okay, it's just the binary subtraction Sudoku, um, and these are the extremes. Okay, so I would not start with questions one, two, three because those are the most difficult ones. <laughs> yes, easy, right? Um, I would, if you're starting off, I would go from the bottom up. Okay, because the easiest questions are at the end. So I will start with questions 16. The last eight questions are supposed to have the same difficulty level. And you can see with this question here, more bits are given to you. Okay, you know, we know more of the zeros and ones. So it should be less difficult to figure out the rest. So I would start from six, uh, question number 16 and then work your, your way back to question number one, except for those of you who think, you know, oh, I can start with the most difficult question. You know, this is the way I, I, I do things. Well, that's fine too. You know, start with whatever you want to do. But this is going to be a good exercise because you really need to know all of the definitions and know how to apply those definitions to answer these questions. Oh yeah. Well, it's the same reasoning, okay? It's constraint-based, you know, type of problem solving. In other words, in some situations, you can actually plug in some values like what if this, right? What if x is 1 and y is 0, okay? What if? And you can you can quickly work out and go like, oh, that cannot happen, right? You know, because if this is this and if, if that is that, then it's going to have a conflict what of with what the 
with a bit that is already supplied. Okay, so you can use that, that type of constraint based reasoning in order to figure out what is the correct answer by sometimes ruling out the incorrect answers. And I get this every semester, so I'm used to it. So there's no need to complain about it because it's not going to work. Is why do we? Why are we doing this? Okay, this is not something that I'm going to do when I'm out there being a software engineer or when I'm out there being a game developer. So why am I doing this? This makes no sense at all. This is a waste of my time. Well, what do you think debugging is? Debugging is the same type of reasoning. Okay, it just doesn't look like this, but it's the same kind of reasoning. So, um, so I'm going to say this really does have, you know, it does train your skills of reasoning uh, by zeroing in into what the actual bits are by ruling out, you know, the ones that cannot be the case. All right, so we got some questions in the text channel. Will we explain why we find how? Yes, you're going to have to explain it too. Now, in the in the exam, okay? Now, there's no guarantee what your exam one is going to look like because I have not decided what your exam one is going to be. This is the exam one from last semester. That's all I can say, okay? That's factual, and that's all I can guarantee is this is what happened last semester. Your exam is going to test the same scope of knowledge and problem solving skills, but not necessarily using the same kind of questions. But I think these are actually pretty representative of, you know, checking out whether you really understand the concepts or not, and whether you can apply those concepts or not. Um, T of zero is an input. It can, it doesn't, it's not necessarily a zero. So this one here is not necessarily a zero. In other words, all the question marks can be zero or ones, but they can only be one. Okay, there's none. None of these questions, you know, have a place where, yeah, this bit really can be a zero or one. No, all of these can only be a zero or a one to be self-consistent with the rest of the bits. Okay, so don't get frustrated too much if you are going like this and you're trying this out and go like, oh, I cannot figure this out. Okay, because there are certain tricks. Okay. And I can give you one clue, okay? I can give you one big clue, is the, the bits that carry the most information, the first one is the overflow. The overflow flag, if it is a one, it tells you a lot about some of the other bits. At least it, pla it places the most constraints to the rest of the bits, okay? So the overflow is one. And then the borrow bits also places a lot of constraints. Okay, so I'll give you one example. I know we are running out of time today, but it's okay to be running out of time today. I'll tell you about that later. So you look at this bit here being a one, and you go like, oh man, you know, this is a borrow of one, and I'm only given that there's only one one over here. How can I possibly figure out the rest of the question marks? And I'll tell you, it's easy, okay? It's super duper easy. The first thing you need to do is to go back to the definition of T1, okay? What is T1? T1 is not X and not X0 and Y0. Look at this. X0 is known to be a 1. There's no way we end up with a borrow by X minus Y. Oh, so that means the only way we can end up with a borrow is Q minus T, right? And then Q minus T can only have a borrow when Q is 1 and T excuse me, the other way around, when Q is 0 and T is 1. So we can now say this has to be a 0 and this has to be a 1 in order to end up with a borrowed 1 over here. That solves everything, right? Because when Q0 is a 0 and X1, X0 is a 1, that guarantees that Y0 has to be a 1 because the exclusive of, of 1 and something is a zero means that something which is y zero in this case has to be the same as x zero which is one and then d is easy to figure out because once we know q zero is a zero and t zero is a one then d zero has to be a one because it is by definition the exclusive or between the q and the d and the t bits of the same column so that is that's just one example okay but the carry bits I mean, the borrow bits, the borrow bits and the overflow bits 
are the most are the bits that give give you the most information. Um, the L flag is important too because it's the exclusive OR between the sign, which is this bit over here, and the overflow flag over here. So depending on which question and how it is asked, uh, the L flag can also be very very useful. Should we expect T zero to be zero or can it be one? It can be can be one or the other, cannot be both at the same time, obviously, but there's no rule to say that T0 has to be zero. All right. <clears throat> I thought T0 was like K0 in the, yep, it is. It is an input, which means it can be one or zero in this case. Because, you know, I didn't, I'm, I'm not telling you whether this is gonna be a chained, you know, subtraction. So, you know, it is entirely possible that T0 can be a 1. So you have to figure out the, the value of T0 just like any other T bits. You cannot make the assumption that T0 is 0 to begin with. All right. So, yes, I know someone is going to say, but Tag, you have been using up so much time, we don't have time for the lab. Well, you won't need time for the lab because there's no lab tonight. <laughs> There's no lab tonight because um, we have covered all of the topics already, and the only thing extra that we have introduced tonight is the L flag, right? The L flag is the exclusive or between the sign flag and the overflow flag. Done, okay? So there's nothing really that new that we, that I can actually make a lab out of you know, tonight. So instead of giving a lab, I'm giving you this practice exam. <laughs> <laughs> so I would use tonight's lab time because I'll be around to answer questions if you guys have any questions. So I would use tonight's time to kind of at least give it a try, you know, to you know, kind of get to these you know, questions over here in the practice exam. Oh, yeah, that's funny. Um, but the exam is not easy, okay? I, I get complaints every day semester okay you know uh, there's always someone saying i'm pretty sure i'm not the only one who finds this exam to be totally irrelevant and way too difficult for us yeah i get that every semester so i'm ready for that i'm so ready for that <clears throat> yes and this part is actually getting recorded too yep all right so anyway um that's what we have today, okay? You know, I, I'm, I, we have no lab for tonight, but I'm giving you this practice exam, and I encourage people to at least give it a try. I know it's not going to be easy the first time you're doing it, but since this is just a practice run, go ahead, you know, give it a try as much as you can, um, and then either I can give you some hints tonight, or I can give you the answers, you know, on Thursday. Okay, so I'll go over every single one of these questions on Thursday. All right. <clears throat> well, that's what I just said. There's no guarantee of what your exam one may look like. Everything is still up in the air. <laughs> you guys need to... Okay, I, I, I need to do this gesture here. You need to pay attention in class, right? Because I just said, I have no idea what your exam may look like. Alrighty. Okay, so I'm going to go offline, you know, in terms of the audio and video. But I will be here, I'll be back here in about 10 minutes or so. So for those of you who are actually giving this a try and have any questions, you know, I'll be here to answer those questions. Yeah, it's more like in the vacuum. It's not even in the air. And this is what I do. I have no idea what questions I'll be asking until eh, maybe about 24 hours before the exam. <clears throat> Alrighty. So I'm getting off of YouTube right now, and I'll be back in about 10 minutes. If you guys have any questions, I will answer those questions. Well, I will respond to those questions. Oh, look at that. Kirby is my favorite character in uh, Smash Bros. 